back onto the runway, pilots must find a low opening for their approach. The only gap, one that skims the rooftop of this congested neighborhood. Pilots must fly manually, carefully steering the airplane onto the runway, a challenge some of them will miss. Having done it 30 years on and off, then yes, I will. There's no other landing really like it in the world, so it's uh, ending the new era. That's because on July 5th, Hong Kong's high-tech airport closes for good, replaced by a newer, bigger airport outside the city, built in somewhat more subdued surroundings. All the flight paths will be over water without obstacles, and uh, people can make straight approaches. But in the meantime, air traffic controllers keep a close eye on incoming flights, a majority of them which use the famous runway 1-3. Every day of the week from about 6.30 in the morning until midnight. And no one can tell you more about them than the people who live right underneath the flight path. Residents over the years have come to endure this. And that. Taking the U.S. Uganda, speaking free, but when the TV is on and the plane comes, so it makes a big noise. Sometimes the kids can't study because of the noise. So it's not surprising Mr. Ng will be happy to see Kai Tak go after living with the rumblings for over 50 years. This is a view he won't miss. But it's not one shared by everyone. Just take a look at the people crowding the airport car park every day, catching a final glimpse of planes touching down. It's also become a hot spot for amateur photographers. One will capture um, the target landing. The target landing is so, so close to the building. So I'm able to catch the distance between the building and the pain. But soon these close encounters of the Kytac kind were just these snapshots of a very special path. Phyllis so Fang, CNBC Asia, Hong Kong. One of the first things that strikes you about Chuklop Kok is its size. It's simply enormous. It was designed by renowned British architect Sir Norman Foster, and he came to Hong Kong when it was finished to explain some of its features. Phyllis so Fang went along the week before the airport opened to hear what he had to say. It's one building under an 18 hectare of 45 acre roof, making this the world's largest airport terminal. But its renowned architect, Sir Norman Foster, says despite its scale, this passenger terminal is traveler friendly and easy to use. On a tour of Hong Kong's new international airport, Foster says orientation is everything. When the train comes along, you immediately see the terminal, you see the main overhang, you step out of the train, and you can see the terminal. So you always know there's only one way to go. And that way is toward the check-in counters, 288 of them, 70 more than the old airport, Kai Tak. Travelers will notice the atrium-like feel of the place with windows all around. Then there is the unobstructed ceiling created by a super lightweight roof, so natural light warms up the space. This area is also the architect's favorite place. This is where you leave from Hong Kong, and this is where you come back. And it is really the same, the same space. What he means by saying space is that there's no need to change floors or terminals, whether you're arriving or leaving. After immigration and security checks, you come to what Foster calls the heart of the airport. 140 shops to keep passengers busy, but also a big part of the modern travel experience. Clearly the size and space of this new airport is something to marvel at, but for passengers this is also going to mean a lot more walking, especially if your gate's at the far end of the terminal. The length of this airport is 1.27 kilometers, but there are moving escalators to take you to the gate, and even a driverless train, which should help reduce the distance passengers have to travel on foot. There are also 12,000 chairs to take a rest in case you get tired. And unlike Kai Tang, this airport has 38 six gates, all equipped to handle 747 planes, meaning the majority of passengers will be able to walk right onto the aircraft. So what happens when you arrive? Again, it's knowing where you are. Travel letters take you to immigration, and then the baggage hall, one that is so big it's the size of Yankee Stadium in New York. And while it's big, it's also high-tech. The luggage system with 12 parasols will handle over 19,000 pieces of luggage an hour. And when you arrive in the greeting area, you'll also notice a familiar space. It's just several levels below, not far from departures. 
to go back where we started, and for Foster, it's the end of a memorable journey. To do a building on this scale is bigger than any building that has ever been built before. So, in that sense, it's a totally new, new challenge. Consider also that the airport was built entirely on landfills, which required leveling several small mountains on an island called Chaplat Cox. When it finally opened to the public on July 6th, it will be operational 24 hours a day, handling 35 million travelers a year. And it doesn't stop here. Hong Kong dreams of making this airport a gateway to the world and plans to build another runway to double capacity to make this the ultimate travel experience. Phyllis Fang, CNBC Asia, Hong Kong. Travelers in a hurry always love Kai Tak for its convenience. If you timed it right, you could leave your home or office just an hour and a half before your flight and still make it on time. But at Check Up Clock, it's a different story. CNBC Asia's Janine Graham checks out the options. A $20 billion engineering marvel. And Hong Kong's future as a transportation hub seems poised to fly high. But travelers have more down-to-earth concerns. It's very inconvenient. It's going to be bad because of the traveling time involved in the cost. It's really a long way to go. And to go to see people off, you have to spend more on some sort. So it's pretty inconvenient. Getting there may seem like a journey in itself. Chekhat Park lies 34 kilometers away from the central business district. But it doesn't have to take too long. It's just 23 minutes from the heart of Central by the new Airport Express. Initially, passengers can enjoy a 30% discount. But after that, a one-way journey will cost 100 Hong Kong dollars. Not cheap, according to some. It's rather expensive. And, and people do voice out their concern or even um, dislike um, to the government about, you know, um, why the fee should be set at such a high level. But it does seem the most convenient option. If you're leaving Hong Kong, you can check your baggage in at the train station in town. Then all you need is your plane ticket. The train has got features like an aeroplane. You know, it's been designed for business class travelers. Well, if the company's paying, maybe you won't feel so bad taking a taxi. About three times the cost of getting to Kai Tak Airport, $350. Well, for some of us, guess the bus will just have to do. That's about 45 Hong Kong dollars. Though it might sometimes feel like you're a tortoise up against the hair. If you really need to count your pennies, though, the underground mass transit railway may be the answer. A few dollars cheaper than by bus. But if you're like some people and can't do without all your worldly possessions, well, obviously this is not the way to go. There's a baggage size limit. And when the line ends, your journey doesn't. You need to get more transport for the last leg to check lap clock. If all of this sounds tough for the traveller, it's certainly a put-off for some who want to bid their farewells. Life might be easier for people with small families and not very many friends when it comes to saying goodbye. It must be someone important to you. Maybe some relative or some of our really good friends who have sent it off. Otherwise, gonna stay at home. But others are more willing to go the distance. I'll definitely go to say my goodbyes, and if it's a relative, I will, for sure. Whatever kind of farewell you manage to get, the best way to the airport, if you can afford it, is to go in style and have a hassle-free journey before the real journey begins. Check that box, please. Janine Graham, CNBC Asia, Hong Kong. Don't go away. We'll be back with more in just a moment, including opening day at Check Up Cox. Welcome back to our special on Hong Kong's new airport. The night of July 5th was a long one for everyone involved in the move from Kai Tag to Chek Lop Kok. Over a thousand vehicles, 70 barges and 30 aircraft were involved. And CNBC Asia's Phyllis Fang stayed up to watch. Planes coming and going. People leaving and arriving all normal activity at Hong Kong's Kai Tak International Airport. Except that after 73 years in service, it will finally be closing down. Touted as too small and old to accommodate the some 30 million travelers who use the airport every year, 
The new airport boasts some of the most modern and spacious facilities ever built at a cost of 20 billion U.S. dollars. People turn out en masse to say goodbye, including this retired Northwest Airlines pilot who first flew into Kaipak in the 1950s. And a wonderful opportunity to see it and be kind of a part of it. Terrific. But most came to get one last sighting of that remarkable landing approach. This man says he came to see what the last hours would be like and witness a part of airport history. Well, the closing of the airport is bringing out two stars to fight that. There's another big event going on, and that is today is also moving day. That means for Lufthansa's catering facilities, which produces meals for airlines, everything had to be packed up. Hundreds of food trolleys, plates, and coffee pots. It's a little bit chaotic, of course, not what it's used to. We have never done it before, but it's went okay so far. All of Lufthansa's vehicles will join Dean's truck, getting ready to be loaded shortly after the airport closes. And as evening sets in and planes taxi on the runway, loading activity near the water is slowly picking up. Machinery too heavy to travel by land and certain types of vehicles will be loaded onto one of the 70 barges taking part in the big overnight move. And as the last aircraft flew out of Kaitak at midnight, 31 others were headed out as well, but they were going to their new home. And about the same time, some 1,100 vehicles made their move along the 28-kilometer route to Chetlat Kog. While the convoy will be moving until the next morning, back at Kaitak, a historic and final note. The lights of the runway were turned off for good. Phyllis so Fang, CNBC Asia, Hong Kong. Not surprisingly, the airport's first day of operations wasn't without hitches. Phyllis Fang brought this report on opening day, July 6, 1998. It's been a day of many firsts. The first airplane to fly into Hong Kong's new international airport also happened to be the first commercial flight to fly nonstop from New York to Hong Kong taking less than 15 and a half hours. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the first passengers. We were just immensely privileged to be on the first commercial aircraft landing here at Hong Kong. They were presented with a special certificate. But being first can also have its drawbacks. It can be a bit confusing arriving in a new place. You see it kind of like a ramp platform going down. There's where the train terminal, taxi, buses, coaches, everything's down there. Just hold. Yep. Just follow the signs, okay? If you have any questions, just ask anyone that's wearing a skirt. Okay. Even frequent flyers need a bit of directing every once in a while. But overall, airport officials were pleased with the day's operation. There were no major glitches. Thousands arrived for the first flights out. Many chose to come by train, one of the major transport links built solely to connect the airport to downtown Hong Kong a 25-minute ride away. Now that Hong Kong's new airport is finally up and running and getting down to business, the important issue of the economic impact of the project is going to be more crucial than ever. Critics say at a time when Asia is trying to survive an economic downturn, the cost of this airport will hurt Hong Kong. I think it's way too expensive. Uh, airports in the region are being built in the neighborhood of 2 to $4 billion or less. And this airport, at a minimum, is costing 12 to 14 for the airport itself with the terminal buildings and the airport structure, excluding the transport links to Hong Kong. But airport officials defend the high price tag. They say they're providing top quality and future opportunities. This is actually not, a, not an expensive airport. People think it's expensive because in Hong Kong's very congested, compressed land space, we've had to construct new roads, new land, a new town, new bridges, links new tunnels, simply to link this airport conveniently into the town centre. In doing that, we've given Hong Kong new room to breathe. We've opened up new harbour space, new land for development. That's part of the overall package. But already, authorities are revising estimated passenger arrivals from 35 million to about 30 million this year, meaning less revenues will be flowing into the airport. Costs such as departure tax and rail tickets have come down, but landing fees for aircraft have been hiked up. In the meantime, Hong Kong's government continues to try to justify the airport's opening and poor timing. But there are high hopes that when Asia starts to recover, the airport will also take off.
Philistine, CNBC Asia, Hong Kong. The airport was hit by another serious problem on its second day of operation. The main air cargo operator, Hong Kong Container Terminal Limited, or HACL, had to move most of its operations back to the old airport after its computer systems crashed, causing major delays. Phyllis Fang brought this report. Problems for HACL, Hong Kong's biggest air cargo operator, began on day one. Its computer system crashed and started misplacing inventory, making it impossible to locate cargo designated for aircraft. We have actually got some very problematic uh, problems at the moment, and we need to buy time, basically, to rectify the situation. We have somehow to reduce the pressure at SD-1. ST-1 is Super Terminal 1, built at a cost of 1 billion U.S. dollars. It boasts on-site loading facilities, but with the present problems, it's being shoved aside. Haskell is going back to its old premises at Kai Tak, where they're now handling over 75% of the air freight. It's created a lot of delays. This Haskell customer says his cargo hasn't left yet, and is afraid air freight companies like his will miss deadlines and lose business. This is a major embarrassment for Hactor, which increased charges by 30% when the new terminal opened, but they say the glitch is costing them too. We're losing money, and it's going to cost us a lot of money to, to, to truck stuff backwards and forwards to check that clock. Company officials say the situation became so severe because of the buildup of incoming and outgoing cargo, they've had to turn away about 30% of their daily business. Hostel has said only perishable cargo on passenger planes will be accepted beginning midnight local Hong Kong time on July 7th. The embargo lasts for 24 hours. Hostel accepts responsibility for the problems and say they've been compounded by the fact that their facilities were not ready to be fully operational until next month. So the company will continue to use the high tax facilities until the problems are solved, but just when that will be, they still can't say. So the saying CNBC Asia, Hong Kong. We'll be back after the break with more. Stay with us. Welcome back to our special on Hong Kong's new airport. While Hong Kong's main air cargo company was losing billions, it was a bonanza for the big express courier companies. Two weeks after the airport's opening, First Bank had this update on the situation. Express shippers like United Parcel Service or UPS are getting a big lift from the troubles at Hastel. They say it's not only business as usual, but more. Now we're already getting bookings and orders in advance. Uh, people are booking three or four days in advance. So the amount of extra business, I really haven't calculated, but I think it's tremendous. A computer failure at Hong Kong's main air cargo company, Hatchel, has crippled its operations for more than a week now since the new airport opened. And companies that have their own fleet and computer systems are cashing in. And they're letting the public know with cheeky ads. UPS is tripling the number of its flights each day, more than doubling its capacity. And FedEx boasts it can still guarantee shipments on time. And to cope with increasing customer demand, FedEx is expanding its operations to take advantage of business opportunities in the market. We've been very quick to react to that volume surge, and we recently received approval to operate five new weekly flights to Hong Kong. This will bring the total number of weekly flights to 21, boosting FedEx capacity by 25%. But these additional flights are just temporary, approved by the airport authority on a week-to-week -week basis. FedEx can't say how much its business has increased, only that the number of customer inquiries is up by more than 30% since the problems at Hastel. DHL has also added flights but admits its business suffered last week because it relied on Hastel to clear its cargo. But DHL is now bypassing Hactel and dealing with the cargo itself. For them, the added flight is to clear backlog and to make sure existing customers are getting taken care of. If there are other customers who now feel that Ex Air Express works for them, we certainly will work very hard uh, to, uh, to live up to the standards that they expect from us. But to go out at this stage and, and seek customers on a willy-nilly basis is probably a little too aggressive for DHL. Realistically, no one knows for how much longer the windfall will last for these courier companies because when Hector finally gets back on its feet, many predict it will be back to a fair playing field. Phyllis Bank, CNBC Asia, Hong Kong. 
Meanwhile, back at the passenger terminal, things were settling down and teething problems were getting sorted out. Phyllis Fang went back to the terminal on July 24th to see how things were running. A sure way to scare off travelers is news of breakdowns and delays. So it's not surprising that there was brisk business the morning after the train that takes you to Hong Kong's International Airport broke down. But we did find some brave passengers willing to chance it. I wasn't particularly concerned because I thought it was sort of a one-off event. And he was right. Ryan got to the airport on time and was off to catch his flight. At about the same time, Clinton Meeks, an airport authority official, was making his rounds, making sure everything from departure boards, telephones, and toilets were now working properly. There's a lingering sort of hangover. People had high expectations for the first day, unrealistically high, really. We sorted out our problems by about the third day, but we're still being affected also by cargo problems. But as far as daily operations go, airport officials say most problems are fixed, and more importantly, air travel is safe. Air traffic control is going superbly. There has been no air traffic control problem from the day we opened. Why? Because the government had in place its air traffic control procedures well in advance of airport opening. And even the initial complaints and worries about lost luggage and big delays in getting your bags appear to have disappeared. Now passengers are giving glowing compliments. It was quicker than the old airport. It was there before we were out of the passport control. The luggage was already there. It was fabulous. But they were among the lucky ones. And only time will tell whether Chet Black Cross will live up to its promise of a revolutionary way to travel. Phyllis Fang, CNBC Asia, Hong Kong. And that's it for our special program on Hong Kong's new airport. I'm Karen Coe. Thanks for joining us.